Good to see everybody this morning. Special welcome to those of you joining us online, or perhaps you're checking out a recording of this later on down the road. Hope everybody had a relaxing um, Thanksgiving. You're ready for that sprint, that four-week sprint to Christmas. Um, Starts today, or started Friday, I guess, doesn't it? So when you came through the door today, you probably ran into this sign. It's a little lower than a normal sign. It causes you to kind of bend at the knee, maybe even bow your head just a little bit to get past it. In part, it's an effort for all of us to assume a humble posture as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. And that's primarily because that's the main topic, that's the the focus of us this week, humility, Um, and for the next four weeks as we prepare our hearts that way. um, You can expect that it's probably going to get a little lower each week, so you may have to work on your humility each week, getting a little bit lower and lower. Um, And that's because it truly is the central passage um, and the central theme of the passage that we're going to be focused on um, during Advent. It's a song that was composed and sung by the mother of Jesus shortly after she learned some amazing news from an angel, that the Holy Spirit would conceive in her womb the long-awaited Messiah. Can you even imagine what must have been going through her head when she found out about this? Especially since she was just a humble, ordinary, single young peasant woman from an ordinary town. Her song is called The Magnificent, and it sings of what's often referred to as the great reversal, where the first are last, and the last are first, where the proud are scattered, and the humble are exalted. It's how things operate in God's kingdom. We saw a little bit of it in the Beatitudes when Jesus kind of flipped our world upside down by teaching us that blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, those who mourn, those who are persecuted. The world doesn't see them as blessed at all, but in God's economy, in his kingdom, those attributes are exalted. The great reversal is what Mary celebrates in her humble condition when she learns of this news. It comes in the form of the long-awaited Messiah sent to rescue God's chosen people and their oppressed state. It also represents what we celebrate at Christmas with the birth of Jesus in the very same condition we find ourselves here in Beaver County in the year 2022. Now to fully appreciate this song, we need at least a wave top understanding of the history of our faith. Because when we look back over it at 30,000 feet, a consistent theme emerges. First, God sets apart a people for himself, his adopted children, heirs of his kingdom. And as such, they're called out to be different from the world in their outlook and in their behavior. Second, from creation to today, however, God's people have continually rebelled against him, against being his chosen nation, being set apart. They've simply refused to humble themselves before him. And when God's adopted children rebel or they sin against him, they suffer. That is the nature of suffering. It's all a result of sin. Now, that doesn't mean if you're going through suffering right now that you necessarily sinned. You might have. It could be because of the sins of other people. It could be because of the sins of generations before us. It could even be as a result of the original sin, that all of creation is groaning because of that one act of rebellion. But in any case, we can know this for sure, that all sin leads to suffering at some level or another. But fortunately, God doesn't leave us in this condition. He saves his people from their misery because he is a merciful God. That's his nature. When their sin causes them to suffer at the hands of a proud and sinful world, God reverses their condition. He pulls them up out of the ashes by sending his son, born into this world, through this humble peasant woman. So to make sure that we fully appreciate the context into which our Savior is born, we're going to go back to the very beginning to remind ourselves 
of some key moments in our faith history. It all starts when God creates the heavens, the earth, and all that is in it. From the very beginning, he sets mankind apart by giving Adam and Eve dominion over much of his creation. You recall each time God created something, at the end of the day, he said it was good. But when he created Adam and Eve, mankind, he said it was very good. But when tempted by the devil, man rebelled, sinned against God. That's the great fall. And man is tossed out from the garden. By around 3000 BC, sin is so rampant, God decides to wipe the earth clean with a flood. But he again sets one family aside, Noah's family, preserving them along with two of each species. After the water subsides, God makes his first of five major covenants with man. And he makes it with Noah. And he promises never to wipe man out that way again. Around 2200 BC, man is once again populating the earth. And they gather in Babel to build a tower to the heavens, but it's a monument to themselves, celebrating their own achievements instead of God's glory. So in response to another rebellious act of man, the Lord dispersed them, and he gave them different languages. Not long after, God makes his second of those five major covenants. This time, he does it with Abraham. At an old age, God gives Abraham a son named Isaac, And God promises to make Abraham's descendants a great nation. Again, God sets them apart, promising that he will be their God and they will be his people. And he even promises to give them land. It's called the promised land. Isaac then has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob is the younger one, and he has 12 sons, becoming the 12 tribes of Israel. One of his sons, named Joseph, is sold into Egyptian slavery by his brothers. But by God's providence, Joseph finds his way from being a slave to becoming Pharaoh's chief assistant, where he eventually saves the nation Israel from a famine. Israel is now in Egypt, but enslaved. In approximately 1500 BC, God calls Moses to lead his people out of Egypt and into that promised land, that covenant he had made with Abraham. And God rescues his people here by sending a series of plagues and facilitating a mad dash through the Red Sea. Even though God stayed with his people and provided for them, like us, they were stiff-necked, perpetual grumblers. So God then makes his third of those five major covenants, this time with the nation Israel through Moses, and he gives them the law, and the law was designed to set them apart. And even though God had a direct relationship with Moses, God actually forbids Moses from entering the promised land because he too rebelled by not doing exactly as he was told. So Joshua ends up leading Israel into the promised land, conquering their enemies, and again, God sets his people apart. For about 400 years, God rules Israel with a series of judges of the likes of Gideon, Deborah, and Samson. But Israel rebels by begging God for a king. God doesn't want to give them a king because God is their king. But they don't want to be set apart. They want to be just like all the other nations. It's that intergenerational nature of sin we see happening from the very beginning through all that we're studying here and also if we look around how we operate today. Despite God's many provisions, Israel continues to grumble until God gives them their first king in King Saul. And God guides Saul. He stays with him through the prophet Samuel. But Saul rebels too, and God eventually removes him. God makes David the next king, a man after his own heart, as David is described, and God guides him too, but this time through the prophet Nathan. David is remarkably prosperous. He conquers many, but he commits adultery, and his family pays a huge price for it. David eventually repents, and he actually wants to make a physical temple for God. But God denies David's request. Instead, God makes his fourth 
of those five major covenants with man, this time, of course, with David. And he promises that one of David's descendants will be the Messiah, the eternal king. Now, God does, however, allow David's son Solomon to eventually build him a temple. Solomon is wise, and Israel prospers, but he too rebels. God's people are then divided in two. There's Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And there are a series of approximately 40 kings that rule Judah and Israel for a series of of 100 or so years. With the exception of a few decent ones like Josiah and Hezekiah, most of the kings rebel against the Lord. Still, God continues to guide Israel and Judah And there are many kings through prophets, such as Elijah, Elisha, and Isaiah. But the kings mostly didn't listen to them either. The kings were sinful, and they pursued their own interests. Approximately 700 BC, God has had it, and he allows Assyria to conquer Israel in the north. A little bit later, he allows the Babylonians to take out Judah in the south and then go up and conquer the Assyrians in the north, forcing both Israel and Judah now into exile. Many prophets, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, lived through this time of exile, and they continued to exhort Israel to repent. These prophets also spoke of a coming Messiah who would usher in a new covenant, the fifth one. And that fifth covenant was going to be unlike the others. It would be written on their hearts, their transgressions forgiven, and God would remember their sins no more. But of course, this fifth covenant hadn't come into play just yet. So this was a time of profound suffering and loss for God's people because of their perpetual rebellion against God. They were literally decimated as a nation, reduced to mere ashes. Approximately 500 BC, King Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon, and he allows the remaining remnant of God's chosen people to return to Jerusalem and to begin to rebuild it. So Israel has been conquered, exiled from the Promised Land, suffered greatly, essentially decimated, and only a remnant remained to rebuild. And if that weren't bad enough, God went completely silent. He no longer spoke through the prophets for approximately 400 years. And all the while, the remnant of Israel was subject to the rule of the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. By some count, there were as many as 351 Old Testament prophecies about a coming Messiah. So the remnant that survived held out hope for a king who would deliver them from their vast oppression. But unfortunately, the same stiff-necked stubbornness persisted even in that remnant after all they'd been through. They still wanted things done on their terms instead of God's terms, a lot like we are today. They were waiting for a king who would conquer their enemies and restore them as a great nation once again. But that just wasn't God's plan. This new covenant was different from the others. The new covenant was going to deal with the sin that separated them from God once and for all. God's new covenant was going to involve the Son of God becoming a man and born into a very common existence. So you can only imagine what Mary must have thought when the angel Gabriel visited her that day, bringing news that she, an ordinary peasant woman, still a virgin, engaged to be married to an average Joe, would conceive of the Messiah by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you think about it in that context, she must have simply been overwhelmed. And so what is her response to it all? Well, in one word, humility. She says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord, Let it be to me according to your word. And then Mary takes a trip to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was also pregnant with John the Baptist, 
And they have this jubilant greeting where Elizabeth extols Mary's humble response to what the angel Gabriel had told her. And then Mary launches into the song. She sings, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. That's her song. Now, as we've said, this magnificent is an often overlooked passage, but it is central to the nativity account. It derives its name from the first word of the Latin version of the song, megalonia, which means to enlarge or tell the greatness of the Lord. And that's why Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now, as a Jewish woman, she's heard all about the Messiah. He's been the only source of hope for Israel for hundreds of years. A humble peasant woman with no standing, an insignificant member of an oppressed remnant of God's chosen people. And so she humbly begins her song by magnifying the Lord and rejoicing in the one who saves her. Now, you may actually find this interesting, particularly if you're one of those grammar people, but in the early Greek manuscripts, magnifies, the word, the verb magnifies, is in the present tense, and rejoice is in the aorist or the past tense, and it denotes an action that occurred without indicating whether it was ever completed or not. Now, this was a common literary device used in the original Hebrew language from which the Greek was taken, and it reflects an overlapping completeness. It's an enveloping of sorts, especially when these two tenses are used in exactly the same sentence. And the way to think about it is this. Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord now in the present tense. And she rejoices in the past tense, not knowing if it was ever completed, meaning as the present tense moves forward, the past tense keeps marching along too, to the point where it actually envelops how she magnifies the Lord. So for the totality of her existence, she has been rejoicing and magnifying in the Lord. It's a neat way for us to think a little bit about how the literary devices used here actually cause us to consider Mary's song and how she actually feels in that moment. And she does all of this describing her condition as a humble estate. Now that phrase in the original language means low, ordinary, and littleness from humiliation. And I know we've all been there at some point or another when someone has made us feel low or has humiliated us. It makes you feel like you're in this deep, dark pit. And no doubt, Mary was in a deep pit. In fact, the whole remnant was, for that matter. And the deeper the pit we find ourselves, the more glorious it is when we're finally redeemed. And that is exactly what Mary is experiencing. Just a servant, but picked by God to be the mother of the Messiah. And she wasn't picked because she was a member of the ruling class, part of the religious elite, or among the wealthy. She was simply a single young peasant woman completely without standing in any regard, at least by the world's standards, she was considered low, ordinary, and little. And yet, she would be called blessed from now on and for all generations. Now, the word for blessed in this context means to be fortunate or counted as happy. And at that time, there was very little fortune 
and happiness for the nation Israel, especially a peasant woman. I mean, as we've described, these were very dark days. And yet as the mountains seemed to be crumbling around them and the cultural tempest roaring against them, up out of these ashes of despair, the ruins seemingly come to life in the womb of a humble servant woman who would be counted fortunate and happy for the rest of eternity, blessed, simply because Almighty God chose her in her humility. Mary sings, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. If you think about that, that's a tremendous declaration. She clearly acknowledges here that he did not choose her because she was somehow worthy. No, it's simply because God is mighty and he chose to do it for her. Can you even imagine if we had that kind of humility? That's a struggle for us, isn't it? Because we try to take credit for everything. We spend most of our days looking for some way to justify ourselves, but not Mary. She understands her humble estate, a servant of her God, chosen by him to bear the Messiah. And of course, we've talked about this word chosen or elect multiple times over this past year, and I realize it can be a tough pill to swallow sometimes. It's a challenge, especially when you first confront this notion of election. But the truth is, it is all over Scripture. It's truth. Israel was chosen. They're called the chosen nation. Each of those characters in the historical count we just walked through, every one of them were chosen. And we see it here again, Mary was chosen. As Paul has been teaching us for the last six months, those who place their faith in Jesus have been chosen as God's adopted children. So if you have placed your faith in Jesus. You are one of God's chosen, one of his elect. And we know this to be true. It's consistent across our theology because we know God is sovereign. And that means he is in complete control of absolutely everything. He chooses his people, make no mistake about it. And when he does, they are blessed. They're fortunate and happy, regardless of the circumstances surrounding them. And then Mary explains why it is that they are blessed as she sings, holy is his name. You see, no matter what condition we find ourselves, we're fortunate and blessed simply because our God is holy. That's something we need to remind ourselves of regularly. Whenever we start finding ourselves slipping down into that pit, no, no, our hope is in our holy God. Our blessing is not a result of us. It's a result of the one who blesses, the one who is perfect, spotless, the one who is pure. Do you see why as sinners in despair, our only response to our holy God can be humility? Like Mary, we are flawed servants of a holy God brought low before him in his holiness. And that's why our pride is such a problem, because it leads to the sin that separates us from our holy God. It's why any success that we happen to have in school, on the athletic fields, or in our careers, anything that leads to pride, it's such a problem for us because it puts us on the wrong side of this great reversal where the proud are scattered. Mary's song brings the condition of her heart, the condition of the nation Israel, and the condition of our hearts into the light of God's truth. It has tremendous historical significance, marking the most dramatic inflection point of all history. It's what all of the Old Testament had been pointing to. It was God's plan set in place before the foundation of the world, that God would save his adopted children. And how would he do it? He would do it by coming to them. You see, we uncover a truth right here. God comes to the humble. That's who he calls. We see it in Isaiah. This is the one to whom I am look. He was humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. And that is exactly what Mary represents. That is why in her humble estate, God comes to her. God comes to the humble. And he came to her in the form of his son. And that son indwelled her as he was in her womb, foreshadowing all that will happen to us as God is coming to indwell us 
as well. So beyond teaching us the truth about the great reversal in God's kingdom, ushered in by Jesus' birth, her song extols God's mercy for those who fear him, as we'll study next week. It sings of Scripture's fulfillment of past prophecy and God's covenant, setting the stage for this new covenant that we live under. It speaks of the future eternal implication for God's people, and it puts us in the path of appreciating what truly happened on that Christmas morning. It was Mary's song reflecting Israel's oppressed state, and it's my prayer that it will become our song over this Advent season. And so our response to the truth of the Magnificat is to humbly receive the sacrament of communion together. So as we gather at the foot of the cross, may we contemplate our humble estate. May our souls magnify the Lord. For we know that God is holy. There has never been the forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. But we also know that God is merciful because under the new covenant, Christ's blood serves as the means to our forgiveness. It's why before the Lord went to the cross to shed his blood for us, he had a meal with his disciples, instituting communion between God and man for all time. Communion is for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And Paul instructs believers before they receive the elements to examine themselves, not to examine yourselves and come to the conclusion that you are unworthy, because that is the conclusion we all must come to. But rather, we examine ourselves to ensure that we have humbly embraced and are marveling at God's grace and the immense price he paid to save us from our sins. So let's take a few moments in the quiet of our hearts to confess our sins, to accept his forgiveness and recommit ourselves in humble obedience to his service. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.